sponsored by the James Madison Council and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Welcome to the National Book Festival. I'm Roz Valencina. Today we are joined by actor, philanthropist, and writer, the legendary Michael J. Fox. His new book is No Time Like the Future. And welcome, Michael J. Fox, to the National Book Festival. How are you? I'm fine, Roz. Well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So I've got to ask you, we've all been going through this. Like the entire country, the whole world has collectively experienced, you know, a very devastating thing. How are you and your family coping through all this? Well, it was an amazing experience for us as it was for everybody else. And, and it happened on so many different levels. In fact, I wrote the book, uh, much of the book during, during the quarantine, or the family's quarantine. And uh, my, my uh, 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 I call her my producer, it's not my editor, but she's my partner, and we've been producing television forever together. And she, I dictate to her and she types it up. So we're on, uh, uh, of course, virtual, we were on, uh, we're on uh, uh, FaceTime, and then I would just sit there and dictate my book and read from my notes that only I can read, and then and she would she would she would write, and it got to where I would leave the room and go get a glass of water for myself, and I bring one back for her, because I, I I it couldn't come uh, like she was in this box, but she was in the room with me, and and it can't it can came that way with everybody in my life, it, my mother who's in Canada, and, um, just just it, people existing in. in in other realities, and it takes some getting used to. It. But it was a, it was an interesting time because I was writing such a personal memoir at a time when when my concerns were global, uh, and my other world, my my concerns were global, but but uh, my concerns professionally were very very personal. And and I think that one kind of the other, it, 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 the, the experiences intermingled. But my family and I were were were, were in quarantine to take shelter for for months months and. It was really an amazing time. We, my, we did a lot of reading, we did a lot of talking, we did a lot of eating, we did a lot of sharing, and and, um, and it was really a, a really privilege. And, and, we, and all the time we were aware of what it was for other people and what they were experiencing. People saying goodbye in hallways and never seeing loved ones again. And it was, a, it, it was a difficult time for the country, but I think they were coming through it. Yeah, I, I know you've written several books um, through the course of your career. Why did you decide this book at this time? This book just kind of happened. I, I was I was going to write a book about golf. I just I, I thought I thought I'd write a book about golf because golf gave me a nice kind of second wind in in, in terms of socially and, and athletically and just a nice thing for that point in my life. And um, so I was writing this book about golf. I was making notes and that, but my notes tend to go off golf and they start to go off in the various uh, about Parkinson's because I was kind of trying to, trying to do this Venn diagram of golf and Parkinson's and you know they, they both suck and they both are really hard and um, uh, so so it started to go that way. Then then I, I got this spinal thing and a tumor on my spine and I had that operated on. Then I broke my arm and and in in, in, in the recovery of, from that spinal uh, uh, I had learned to walk again and I fell and hurt myself and, and I just I found my optimism my my much valued optimism. Uh, uh, leaving the scene quickly. I mean, just, just vacating me. I was saying, I'm out of the lemonade business. It just, it just, it just really uh, reached a, a dark point for me. And, uh, and, and, and as I experienced it, I came through it um, with a lot of lessons learned from, from Gus, my dog, and, and my father-in-law, not, not necessarily in that order, but uh, so many people in my life, my wife, Tracy, my kids, uh, my friends, um, I, I I saw I saw I saw uh, something that, that that we'll get to it eventually in the conversation, but but that that with uh, gratitude, optimism becomes sustainable. Did you see that? I just got that. It just it just came to me and uh, I said that's 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 what it is. You can get through anything if you find gratitude. If you find something to be grateful for. I know that was your advice um, from your father-in-law when he said that. How much did that sustain you and your family uh, through the through this past year? A lot, because, because I really, because I really started to see it. I mean, it wasn't just the words; it was like I could see my gratitude, and I could see 
in 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 some of the offhand remark my child one of my children were making the children are all grown up but but what some remark they're making I just go well wow, that's amazing I mean it's it's it, it, it's it's like it's a shame that all the all the uh, the, the the stuff in, in in Minneapolis that happened during in the middle of the the, the COVID um, these were so they, it's just profound pronouncements about it in, in, in the expressions of the of, uh, of 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 their their solidarity and their their their, their um, concern and and I was just I was just like wow this is I hate that this is happening but I love that it's bringing this out in my in my kids and bringing this out in in, in their among their friends and uh, it's, it's just an interesting time because because for every every rock we, you, you turn it and see and it's on the other side it could be gold on the other side. Uh, it, it's it's just uh, and we we have to especially think that way now uh, because uh, there's, there's it's just so easy to, to 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 make a negative choice to make a negative negative turn and 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 we just we really need to make positive forthright forward steps. And I know you uh, you mentioned it earlier. A lot of people are familiar with the term. You know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, at the very beginning of the book, you said, you know. I'm out of the lemonade business. I mean, if you, if you can't sustain, um, you know, being optimistic and, and positive, how are the rest of us mere mortals able to go through the rest of this? So, well, um, I said that, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna ask you like, what's your advice to everyone um, who's, who are still suffering or, or are languishing um, as we go get to the other side of this pandemic? Well, I would say whether it has to do with the pandemic or whether it has to do with the ancillary you know, um, um, side issues that, that come up, employment issues or family issues or or, or any any education issues, um, it is it, it's, it's just that it sounds really trite, but but, but I don't mean to be glib, but 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 accept it, accept accept, see what it is, look at what it is, don't be afraid to look at it, and don't be afraid to look at all the nasty corners of it and all and all the stuff that. The, 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 don't look at what's not there, and don't, don't look at what's there. It doesn't take up all your life. It doesn't take up all your space. There's still, there's still room for you to thrive on the edges, and you can. And basically, that'll 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 shrink that the, the, the central problem. Um, it's, it's just it's just it's just holding on to that, holding on to that. Like I said, said it you need to be grateful. You be grateful. Uh, you, you you may you may not like your working conditions, but but you gratefully have a job, and then and, and then you can run from there. Or you you may you may um, you you may not uh, like teaching your kids over the computer, but but you're grateful that, that they're still in school and in some fashion. So I mean, it's it's, it's all my my position or my 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 um my circumstance when when I when I got that low and I said that about the lemonade and. And I said a lot of other things. Um, I I was sitting under a phone on, uh, on the phone on the wall in my kitchen with a shattered arm and I shattered my humerus. It was it was a little torn up and and, uh, and useless. And I'm, and I'm waiting for the ambulance. And I called my assistant. And she called an ambulance. And so I had this time. And it was it was kind of like like the the the, the, the young uh, uh, um, uh, 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 what am I saying? Um, Young student under the, the Bodai tree, you know. I was I was on the kitchen floor, slumped under a phone with a broken arm, and um, and I just said, "Who am I to tell people to be optimistic?" Well, I, I'm, I'm miserable right now. I'm I'm, I'm really angry and, and I'm frustrated at myself, and I'm, I'm I'm angry at and not angry at anybody. I'm angry at me for for, for letting this happen. And the, the Parkinson's was my fault. I couldn't do anything about that. The the uh, the, the spinal tumor was my fault. But the falling was my fault because I, I was I was not careful, and then by not being careful, I, I was I was um uh, uh, not being respectful to my doctors and my and my healthcare people that helped me. So my family that stuck by me through through my rehabilitation and, and uh, my 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 uh, friends and 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 I just felt I let them all down. I and I thought I thought I let the Parkinson's community down because because I'm telling them to, to chin up and then it'll all be okay and it's forward to the cure. And then here I am, uh, whining and mewling on the, on the floor of my kitchen. So, so that that was that was the low point. But um, 
and it's okay to go there. I mean, that's what, that's what I learned. So it's good to go there. It's good to go to that low point and and and, and really look around and, and and get help if you need it and and and, and find answers to your, to your questions. Um, but the, what you can't do is run away from it. You can't. Then it doesn't happen. You have an amazing support system between your wife, your kids, your in-laws, your friends, uh, your golfing buddies, um, and your dog, Gus. Um, you know, on behalf of the Library of Congress, we want to send our condolences to you and your family regarding Gus. How big are, did Gus play, your family play, in bringing you back up? But, but Gus was, uh, I, I, my son went to college uh, in uh, it was the year that uh, President Obama was elected in. 2008, and um, uh, and he and I was left. I, I had a joke. I was I had my three daughters and my wife. And I, was, I was drowning in a sea of estrogen. I, was just, I, I had no male uh, contacts in the house. So so I, I we were on vacation at Martha's Vineyard, and I, I saw an ad uh, on on a, on a bulletin board outside at a community store, and um and it was for this dog. They they called him Astro at the time, but it was just this. You could tell he was, was a puppy, but was, you could tell he was going to be huge. And I, I, I liked the idea of a huge dog. So I took note of it and I went home. And, and then I, Tracy, I was, Tracy said, she was on a bike ride and stopped at the show marks were independent of me. I saw this billboard on the, I said, Astro, you saw that? And she said, yeah. I said, well, let's go find this dog. So we, we, we tracked down the owner and, and went and saw the dog. And, um, and I just immediately knew. And, and he, and he, and he, as, as I took him in, and he's got bigger, he, he was he was uh, he was thirty pounds when I got him. He was one hundred twenty pounds as, as as biggest, and and he he would out uh, he he knew that I had issues, and he would he would he he never jumped on me, he never he never pushed me, he never he never put weight on me. He was always really, really careful with other people. Uh, I I don't I don't need to see my trainer. Picture here. Of, um, when I would when I would do uh, work out, do yoga and stuff, um, if I would complain, if, if, if the exercise made was too strenuous, um, and I made a noise, he'd get really concerned, and he'd come over and he'd sit on the mat, and he he'd just like he'd protect me. I, I I was doing a virtual with my trainer, my physical therapist over the the uh, uh, voice. Say Facebook, face FaceTime, and um, so he would hear that voice, and he come running in to protect me. And um, that, that's 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 Gus in a nutshell. I do want to ask you about your father-in-law, Tracy's father. He gave you some great advice that you talk about in the book. He says, "With gratitude, optimism becomes sustainable." Um, I think those are very wise words that we could all kind of hold on to. How much did he mean to you, and how much did his words help you? He was a great man. He was a really, he was a really uh, pure. He, he, what he, his optimism and his and his uh, his um, optimism and his, his his positive energy was 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 so real. There was nothing. There was nothing uh, um, at all synthetic about it. He he just he really he just said it gave he just said it gets better. It, it gets better. And and, and he um. When when I had difficulty, like one of my favorite, one of my favorite things I ever had to say in my life was sentence I ever got to utter was, um, um, "Steve, this is President Obama. President Obama, this is my father-in-law, Steve." And um, and it was like that was a great moment. Um, so you, you live to please him, but he he had he had he had he had a law firm, a law practice, and he would help people make decisions, life decisions. Whether to buy a house, whether to keep your old job, get a new job, or do whatever, make big decisions in their life about the children or whatever. And he had a son on his desk that said, professional fear remover. And that's the best description of I, I could think of. He just, he just could zone in on your fear and alleviate it and by telling you the possibilities that you had, that you didn't know that you didn't know you had capability to do certain things. And I mean, you can say no to people. You can say, and you say yes to things that you know he say get the house get the house get the new job have another kid it's all positive stuff and he helped me a lot during when i was first diagnosed and i was struggling with the idea that 
I, I married this beautiful, vivacious, amazing, intelligent, brilliant woman, and then they saddled her with this potential out, uh, health outcome. And uh, she was really great. Obviously, she was really supportive, but he, he was, he, he said, don't worry, you know, he, he I don't want to say it, but feel bad for your daughter. Because I, I, she's in this situation. He said, don't, she did good. I was at a commencement um, uh, over the weekend and somebody asked the, the, the students who were graduating, what have they learned from this past year? Or has it changed them? What do you tell your kids um, in your optimistic way of what happens now post this pandemic for them? I think that, 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 that by thinking about, uh, it was a rare opportunity to, to, like I said, to think of, to, to, to be by yourself and spend a lot of quality time with certain people, uh, and, and 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 a lot of time by yourself, and enjoy that time. But at the same time, be developing a, a concern and an empathy for, for 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 other people because of what you know they're going through. It's really like you, be, being being in quarantine, protected from it, didn't make it any less. You know, oh great, we're safe, and we're safe, but what others are going through. And, and I think that, that anytime there's a burst of empathy like that, anytime there's a burst of awareness about other people's experience on this planet, and what they're going through and what, what their needs are and what their, what their fears are and what their goals are and their wishes and their ambitions. And we, we can tap into that and we can, we can rally around a common cause and, and achieve great things. It's, it's so, it's so, the thing about this country is it's just, we're so on the cusp of greatness and the cusp of disaster at the same time. And it's just, it's just, it, you just know, if you're a positive person and an optimistic person like me, you just know, just take that one thing that just pushes over the line, well, and our lives will be so much easier and safer and, and, and uh, more what we want them to be. It goes well with uh, what you wrote in your book. You say that, can you be an optimist and a realist at the same time? Um, have you found the answer to that? Can we? Yeah. You can you can be a realist and an optimist at the same time. In fact, I think it, it, it requires being a realist to be an optimist. You have to, you have to look at the, what the ground is around you. You have to be real about it and say, this is, these, these, these facts are, are, are non-disputable. Non, non, non these, these, these are the realities as we see them. So we approach that reality uh, with respect for it and, and, and respect for it that, that it's the truth, and then we can, we can act on it. And we can we can see. I, I was I, I, I was picture it as a as a block of, you know the, 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 the there's room around it. There's room around any problem, and, and in that room in that margin, you can find answers. Um, you know, I'm a child of the '80s. You know, I grew up watching you on Family Ties, grew up watching the Back to the Future movies. Um, so your um, legacy in cinema is clearly cemented. Um, you know, here at the Library of Congress, we added um, Back to the Future to the National Film Registry a couple years ago, and every year we show, show films on the lawn, and Back to the Future is probably one of the most requested films. Till this day, why do you think that um, those films, especially Back to the Future, still resonate, and what would you like to tell the fans of the film up there? Well, you know, I think of it in terms of, um, uh, it's funny, I just thought of when you said that, People sit on the lawn and watch the movies. Is that what you said? Yes. Uh, and then there's a there's a song by by James Taylor that for a lot of reasons I relate to. It's called "That's Why I'm Here," and he says that it, some of, fortune or fame is a curious game. Perfect strangers call you by name, pay good money to hear fire and rain again and again and again. Uh, Somewhere like summer coming back every year, got their baby, got their pancake, got their bucket of beer. I can break into a grin from year to year because that's why I'm here. And I, I just feel that it, it's just such a privilege to, to, to be a part of people's lives that you don't know and, and, and to, to, to inform transitions in their lives, whether it's a television or a film or, or whatever. And Back to the Future is like, when I was a kid in Canada, um, we had like two channels and you got what you got on, on the TV. But every year around Christmas time, they showed The Wizard of Oz. And I'd watch it every year. And we had black and white TV, so we never, I never got the transition, you know, that was lost on me. But I love the flying monkeys. And I, and I was having a conversation with someone about Back to the Future and how, tra how transgenerational it is. And how, 
how young kids love it and old people love it. And it's just it's one of those moves that struck a chord. And, and I said, and I said, yeah, I just realized I, I'm now a flying monkey. <laughs> Now, we know that your film and uh, TV legacy is clearly cemented, but I should say that one of your biggest legacies um, is the Michael J. Fox Foundation. You've raised more than a billion dollars for Parkinson's research. Um, do the people that you meet through the foundation um, motivate you, inspire you? I know people like um, Jimmy Choi that you mentioned in the book, and just some everyday people that you could meet on the street, like at the Cinnabon um, um, at, a, at a rest stop. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, it's amazing to feel connected to people that, that you don't know. It's like I said, the, the line, the, um, curious gang people, perfect strangers call you by name. Um, and, and they, and they, and they, they're, they're sincere in their, in their, in their approach. And uh, people, are, I, I've never had nasty people to me. I've just been lucky. I've always had people who've very nice to me. Um, I think that uh, with the foundation, it, it originally started out that I wanted to, I wanted to focus on research, and, and I, I felt that I talked to a lot of scientists, and I was at a particular point in my life where I was deciding whether to start to grind out my career a little longer or, or get right to work on, on the foundation's work and promote science. So I, I decided to focus on science, and uh, we, we, we figured talking to scientists that the science was ahead of the money, that, that, that if we could really raise the funds, that it, it could be immediately funneled to, to, to worthwhile. Uh, 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 projects and um and and that happened in new got a good start we, we kind of it was a broken system and we found ways to circumvent problems and correct other problems and and uh, uh create a good relationship with with, with uh science community and with with uh, pharma and all that stuff but along the line i realized that there was a patient community that was waiting to be activated and waiting to be involved and waiting to to be able to be a part of their own rescue and to be to be the answer that they're looking for. And, and to be, they got involved in clinical trials and we got involved in, 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 in collecting uh, uh, just personal data, personal information about their life experiences. And, 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 and it became a very patient-driven foundation. And, and then it started to flourish. And uh, because uh, when, I, when I first uh, disclosed that I had Parkinson's, it was considered pretty much an old person's disease. And, and so therefore, because those people weren't necessarily vibrant and active in the community on a daily basis, we didn't see it, we didn't know much about it. So I kind of, in an unbidden way, um, became someone who could be an example of the fact that it affected a younger population and that we had the, the time and the, and the energy to, to, to facilitate a, 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 either good therapies or, or possibly cure. So it, it just it, it exploded into into a patient movement, and uh, Jimmy Choi, who you mentioned, uh, American Ninja, he's, he's he's an amazing guy, and uh, he, he's an example of of, uh, of never quit, never never give up, and, and um, he's going to be part of the answer. You you say in your book, if you don't take risks, there's no room for luck. Do you think your optimism helps you uh, carry you through uh, making tough decisions, whether it's your career or um, medical decisions? Yeah, I think you just, I, I, I always feel that, that um, well, one thing is I, I, th I think I'm a good judge of, of, of people, of, of doctors, of, of people that were involved in the foundation or people that, 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 that become available to me to, to work with. Um, and, and I've been really lucky, again, with some people, some directors that maybe others wouldn't consider that I thought were great, and it turned out great. And without the risk, you don't get the luck. Without the without the uh, some material that I thought was like like I like writing this book, this latest book about again in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm writing I'm writing about my navel, and um and and, and it's a risk, but but it turned out that people related to it on on on, on both terms, on both levels. That, that it was about about my navel, but it was about the world too. And um, so you just got to take a risk, and it's, it's tough pouring this stuff out because um, you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't even realize I felt that. And, and it's a little of the beautiful things about writing. Out. Writing's been a great thing for me to, to, to as as things fritter away. I mean, I, I used to draw a lot. I can't draw now because my 
let my hands turn around. I don't play the guitar as much anymore. I don't, uh, I don't hike and run and boat and bike and all that stuff. But, but I, I enjoy my family. I enjoy reading. I enjoy writing. And writing has become a real, it's become everything for me. It's just so great to, to take an idea and look at it from 10 different ways and realize that there's a one way to express the purity of that idea. And, and you determine to find it. And you, if you come even close, it's, you just sit back and go, right, that's it for the day. This wouldn't be the National Book Festival if I don't ask you what books have inspired you or what books have you been reading during the pandemic? During the pandemic, I wasn't reading a lot because I was, I was writing. But um, books that have inspired me over the years, I mean, I, I like Cormac McCarthy. I like all the pretty horses. I like, uh, I like, um, like uh, the bird artist, Norman Howard, or Howard Norman. I keep getting his, his name mixed up. But he's a terrific writer, and it's a great book about redemption to art. Um, you know, I like, and I'm always a sucker for whatever nonfiction is popping. I'm reading a book right now by, I wish I could remember his name. He's, a, I think, a Harvard professor, a Princeton professor, about uh, uh, running uh, the Trump uh, administration through the filter of Shakespeare. And uh, very, very uh, events to events in, in King Lear and other things. So it's, 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 always, it's always something interesting to read. When you were growing up or as a kid, what books opened the world to you? When I was growing up, well, I loved, I loved, I, I discovered in like fifth grade, Agatha Christie. And I just got hooked on Agatha Christie. I read, I read that. And then there were none. And then I just read as many as I could. And I just had this like 10 year old kid in, in, in Canada reading about, uh, Fets in, in, in pastoral England and butlers doing it with a candlestick in their pantry. And, um, and it, just, it, it just captivated me. And then I, and then I kind of ran around and sat into Tolkien and started to read all those books and Hobbit and, and, the, and the, the, the ring cycle. And, and it just, and then just, I just, my world just expanded. I mean, it's just like books. I, I have books that are in there. I don't even think of like, like this room, I don't think of having books in, but I have like, 60 books in this room and and and, and i know this isn't even one of my rooms with a lot of books in it i have I, these books are everywhere in my life i have to pick up a book to get a book that's underneath the book um and, and it's just it's it's it, and it can't replace it i can't i, I do audio books i do uh, uh you know uh, scroll it on my, my ipad but but there's nothing like a book it smells like a book and it it was like a book, and it reads like a book, and it it, it just makes you feel good like a book. Uh, you see it firsthand through your brother-in-law, Michael Pollard, and your friend Harlan. How do you think books create a community of bringing people together, whether it's a book club or the National Book Festival or, you know, just reading as a family? Well, it's, 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 it's changing ideas. My, my wife had her, had her uh, book club last night. It was the first time in a year and a half that they, go, they actually got together able to sit across from each other and drink their wine and talk about their books. And, 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 and it was like, it was like, she was talking about it. There was a look in her face, just like, like this was a great thing. It, she had to have her book club with her friends and talk about the books they'd read. And they, they'd only been able to do it by Zoom and, 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 but to be together and sit around and pass wine to each other and pass bread to each other and to, to, to touch the books and, and, uh, and, and pass them out. And, um, it's, 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 it's a great, it's a great exchange of ideas. It's, it's, it's a chance to, to get an idea, form your own opinion, form your own feelings about it, or to, to discover your own feelings about it and then share them. And then, and then they're, they're, they, they influence other people's feelings and people, other people's feelings influence yours, but it's all, it's all a uh, communion and, and, and books, books are, are a great communion. Uh, Binding, powerful force. After finishing your book, do you believe you're back in the lemonade business? Oh, absolutely. Uh, pink, pink, and pink and yellow. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> we do have a surprise for you. Um, you were talking about earlier about some of your doctors. So, um, I am lucky enough that I have some good friends at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. So I have um, a short video from someone who literally has your back. Let's look at this video. 
Oh my God, this is amazing. Michael, I want to congratulate you on an absolutely amazing book. And as an American icon, you have given so many people hope and joy in their lives. And I think the message is quite clear. There is no time like the future. I wish you the best and look forward to seeing you soon. Easy to die. That is not Dr. Nicholas Theodore who operated on your spine in, in Baltimore. Um, how do you feel seeing him today? He was like, I was talking about like when you know when you meet people and you just know the right person. I was talking to him, we were going through the, 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 the mess that was my spine and my situation, how tired it was really. And, uh, and, and he was going through the, what he could do and what, what, what he couldn't do and what could be fixed and what couldn't be fixed. And then, uh, and then I, we were talking about the fact that other surgeons weren't willing to take it on. He was willing to take it on. And he said, he said, well, I understand where you're coming from, though. He said, who wants to be one who puts Michael Fox in a wheelchair? And I said, I love that you said that. Uh, and, and it just, I knew that second, like, he just, he just got it. He got that it was real. That this was not a, this was not a, a, a make-believe thing. This was a real, it meant that I was going to go through and he was going to get me through. And he, and he immediately installed, instilled trust in me that he would get me through it, and, and he did. And we've been good friends and, and followed up ever since. He's, he's a good man. But he was reading all his bits. And, and then when I, when, I, when I first saw a photograph of him reading the book, I thought, this, here's a book of my, my surgeon reading about my surgeon. He, he circled the bits. He circled his bits. I want to end it by saying, I know you've got a birthday coming up in a couple of weeks. Happy birthday from everyone here in Washington. Um, and I wanted to, you know, if you had to go back and tell your, you know, 20 something self, what advice would you give them? Slow down, slow down and just, just, just enjoy. I was, I was, I was racing around so much when I was younger and, and, um, you know, things happen for a reason. I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, necessarily say it's all planned out but but uh but it's, it's stuff to be learned from everything there's there's there's, there's additions uh, on the other end of every uh, subtraction with, with every subtraction you gain, you gain something it fills that space and and if you if you're a cautious steward of it you you, you can you can fill it with really good stuff and so when i was a kid i would fill it with parties and alcohol and and and, and fame and all that stuff, and, and now it's like family and love and and and, and, and just pleasure, bliss. Well, we are blessed to have you today, Michael. The book is No Time Like the Future. Welcome to the National Book Festival. We hope to see you soon. Your you and your family have an open invitation to come here to the Library of Congress. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll take you up on it. Yeah. Can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation, and now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Kelly Chisholm, and I am a moving image archivist in the National Audiovisual Conservation Center at the Library of Congress. The National Audiovisual Conservation Center's Packard campus, where I work, is located in Culpeper, Virginia, and it houses the moving image section the recorded sound section, and three preservation laboratories for film, video, and audio materials. The campus houses nearly nine million items in total, over three and a half million recorded sound elements that range from wax cylinders created in 1900 to newly released podcasts, and almost two million moving image items that come from the 80-year history of television, the 40-year history of home video games, and the over 120 year history of motion pictures. I have one of those items from motion picture history with me today, a 35 millimeter film print of the 1985 movie Back to the Future, directed by Robert Zemeckis and starring National Book Festival featured author Michael J. Fox. This print was donated to the collection by Universal Pictures to commemorate the addition of this film to the National Film Registry in 2007. The National Film Registry selects 25 films each year showcasing the range and diversity of American film heritage to increase awareness for its preservation. 
On the surface, a science fiction comedy, it manages to comment on nostalgia, generation gaps, family folklore, and growing up. And in the center of that movie is Marty McFly, a teenage everyman thrust into an unbelievable situation and played with warmth and humor by Michael J. Fox. It's hard to underestimate the impact this film has had on the generation of children that grew up with it, many of whom are now parents and showing it to their own children. Phrases like, great Scott, 88 miles per hour, and you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? are a part of the American cultural lexicon. They are also phrases that resonate in my head for a very particular reason. When I was in high school in the mid 90s, my very creative and enterprising friend, Rob Jeffers, made his own remix version of Back to the Future, none too small a feat in the mid 1990s. The result, which we watched on a particularly long bus ride for marching band, was silly and haunting and funny, and it was the kind of thing that someone would only do with a movie that everyone already knew so well, that you wanted to remix it to see what else you could discover within. Back to the Future was so ubiquitous and beloved in my own childhood that Marty McFly saying, you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Echoes in my brain to this day, just as it echoed over Rob Jeffers remixed version of the movie that he showed a bus full of teenagers 25 years ago. Back to the Future is one of 800 films on the National Film Registry chosen for their contributions to American film heritage. You can find out more about the Film Registry on the Library of Congress website, loc.gov. On the Library website, you can also find the National Screening Room and the National Jukebox, which makes some of those 9 million items from the moving image and recorded sound collections accessible online.